I am unashamed. What about you? Al, when I was 22, 22 years old, I was with your uncle who has passed on, Tommy. Tommy was 24, I was 22. <clears throat> we went up uh, on the Washita to the north of us toward Arkansas, and we were ducking. So we asked an old fisherman, where are all the ducks? And he said, they're up there on the prairie. I said, prairie, what, what would that be? He said, a big opening in the woods up there. So he told us how to get there. We pulled up through the woods. We went like five miles up the river and we were riding around on about a 25,000 acre block. Who owned this? Uh, uh, at the time, timber companies. Now it's a refuge. Yeah. But at 22, we were attending Louisiana Tech University. Uh, we we'd, we'd arranged our classes where we had classes on Tuesday and Thursday for half a day. And the rest of the time, we hunted and we fished. So <laughs> I had Tommy with me. I'm 22 years old. We pulled up on. We finally made it to what the commercial fisherman told us was a prairie. We looked out there, unbeknown to us, the Germans had come through and made whiskey barrels from overcup acorn trees in this area. Well, they had taken out a lot of overcup acorn trees and took the logs back to Germany <clears throat> where they made whiskey barrels. At <laughs> 22, when I saw that, grass had come back when they had spaced out those trees. It came back in grass, but not trees. So they did this in the 30s. I was looking at it in the late 60s is when I was looking at it at 22 years old. I'm looking out there at what the Germans had done to cut the whiskey barrels, and the sight of that stayed with me my entire life after 22. Now I'm 75. I figured out a way. Jace is in with me, and Willie, we all went together, we bought enough real estate that I'm going to recreate what I saw back there when I was 22. So think about it. It's been, uh, what, 50? 53 years. 53 it's years. amazing you can remember that far back. It's amazing because I never <laughs> forgot it. And one reason that I didn't forget it is when we pulled up, my motor started dragging. We ended up just watching which direction the ducks were going. Uh, based on what the commercial old commercial fisherman had told us. So when we got there, I looked out there, and there was at least a minimum of 10,000 mallard, pintail, widgeon, all kinds of ducks were out there on that grass and that thing. I said, you know, I told Tommy, I said, Tommy, is this legal? He said, it's legal. Timber company owns it. No rules, no regulations, no posted signs, no refuge, nothing. So we commenced to getting out there and started pouring the lead to them. So literally <laughs> 50 years goes by, and I walked out there yesterday evening. We bought a block. It's not 25,000, but it is 400 old growth timber. And I've got, I'm marking the trees, and I'm going to replicate and duplicate what I saw when I was 22. I know exactly what it looked like because it it, it was burned into my brain. I never dreamed <laughs> that the opportunity would come along 50 years later and I could re recreate that type of real estate. So we're taking out all the undergrowth and the brush. The trees are huge like they were north of here. Gigantic oak. So... We're thinning out all the brush and the little trees. And this one will be probably about, I think the one I saw in the Washita 20, uh, 50 years ago was probably about 40 acres of grass in the middle of a giant forest. This is a substantial forest today, the one we're making, but I'm going to recreate a smaller version, probably 25, 30 acres of grass and I figured out how to flood it. We can put about a foot, foot and a half of water on it fairly easily. 
So we have re we are in the process of recreating what I envisioned way back 50 years ago. Well, you know what else is interesting as part of that story <clears throat> is that also within about six years of you seeing that, you would not become a Christian, but then you would start a duck call business based on your love of duck hunting, which which opened the whole door for everything we've been doing for the last 40 years. And not only that, the and old the commercial calls, fisherman. Uh, yeah, the duck calls. You became an old commercial fisherman. I became an old commercial fisherman, <laughs> and then the duck calls provided the funding for the the grass patch, the, the, the scene I saw back there when I was 22. I'm going to recreate a smaller version of that scene. It is one, this well, when you pull up to it, if you walk up to it or you drive a boat in there close and you look down through the woods, even you, Al, we'll all go. So I'm getting the blind locations lined out and all that. But once you see this, you will say that is one of the most beautiful places I've ever laid my eyes on as far as duck hunting go. It is gorgeous. But most people from cities and rural places, I mean, you got this land, some of it, it was so dirt cheap because people saw no value in it whatsoever. Floods, it, floods. Yeah. Volatile. Yeah. I mean, nobody wants it. You just think here, here was land. You, you're looking at trying to fulfill a vision that you had 50 years ago. And other people are looking at it like, why would you want this? The watermarks. If you look up at the trees, the water lines are up. 20 feet on these big trees, 20 feet. That's how high the water will get up on any given year. It'll rise from some ground zero, dry ground, to 20 feet deep. And just think about that volatility of an area. But that's where we're, that's where we're fixed to camp out. And I've got, got us a houseboat, the, the frame and the pontoons, I've got one that's I've worked my way back in there up a little slough up there, a bayou. So I've got one on the premises and we're fixing to frame it up, brush it. And as soon as the water comes out there a foot, foot and a half deep, I'm just going to put her right on out there. I have my blind locations already being put in before we take all the brush out, but I've got it all worked out, including a duck blind that's sitting there on standby so we're going to paint it black, camouflage it, frame it up, and we'll just I'll just put her out there with a little motor. I don't need but a foot of water, and I just put her out there. Eat, get it, put it up, up against some trees, some brush. I'm going to have it all worked out the same. So I'm just like a slot. I just pull it in there. We all get up on the shooting ports, put our decoys out, and we got our grass patch in the middle of the river bottom. So you've created a play. The vision is what I like. A playhouse for adults. When I'm gone, when I'm gone, and when Jace is gone, the ones that come up beneath us, when they when they look out there after we're long gone, they will say, "This has got to be." I'll probably plant some cypress trees out there in the middle of it, like make a little lake out in the middle of it, maybe. <laughs> but uh, when we get done with it, it will be a picture that. Uh, will be a good mark that I left on planet Earth. Beautiful thing. That's one of the things I want to do <clears throat> one, post-resurrection, because I'm sure if you control the atoms and the molecules in time, you can actually see the planet before it was inhabited Yep. by humans. I'd, li I'd like to take a look at that. It would be amazing. amazing. Why couldn't you do that? That's I would think God will show us a picture of what it looked like. I like it. We long for, for the a new heavens thing. and a new earth. You say that would be quite the sight if God said, look at what this whole thing looked like before humanity got a hold of it. But look what it looks like now. This is a picture of it. I would love to see you know, the closest thing, a pristine The closest earth. thing to that now is probably let's take a trip to Alaska and – you know, look, look at some of that real estate because there's there's most of that is untouched by human hand. It's it's really yep. and it is amazing. I mean, it's just this natural beauty of it is mm -hmm. incredible because dad's seen it as well. Jace, you've never been to Alaska, have you? I hadn't. But the only reason I haven't 
is because I was scared I wouldn't come back. <laughs> yep. I'm serious. You may not. I understand. Well, I mean, they're like, it's the last true wilderness and you can yep. go out. And I thought, you know, I better not go up there because I, <laughs> I kind of like our ministry here and our family and what we do. And so I, I think I've done an event in 45 or 46 of the 50 states. I'm trying to do all 50, but I haven't been to Alaska yet. We went there with, uh, uh, Franklin Graham flew over the mountain range, lit on a gravel <clears throat> run, runway, just a gravel. That's my first gravel one, right? In the middle yeah. of nowhere, and big lake there, you know, and he's got a big cabin there and all. And, and the marriage, uh, were you there with us, Al, when the marriage? Yeah, uh, I was there. Marriage, remember? That was the, pretty cool. They though. do a, all, all summer they do a it's called operation heal our patriots and his son you know is a veteran and so what they do is they help military person they all that have been injured especially and came home from you know different things injured and they bring them there for a marriage refresher and uh, for about a week and they do that every summer and so we just happened to be up there doing another appearance and they invited us franklin invited us up just to meet the people and and it was pretty amazing when it died because we were standing in a line when that plane flew in with those 10 or 12 couples they yep. got off the plane and everybody in the town port allsworth came out and they had their little flags they were waving them and of course yep. everybody was getting off the plane was already in tears then they saw us there and right at the front of the line was Cy si and you and the rest of us and it was really just a really neat moment i mean not only did we get to you know be there for those guys yep. but also what they're doing with that ministry is incredible because it changes a lot of lives you know to get up there and just kind of get away from everything franklin said that your closest neighbor was 60 miles <laughs> yeah <laughs> 60 miles He's and everything's down. by <clears throat> yeah everything's by plane remember dad so we, we went up yeah. and, and and sat on the bluff of a river and saw trout and bears and you know sea otters and all these different oh, creatures yeah. it was it was a pretty amazing trip yeah. so jace you had an anniversary right i did it was the first time in 31 years i guess i can say this i didn't even know it was my anniversary I didn't even know it was, we were in August. I was surprised. <laughs> Somebody sent me a text. I saw it on Twitter. I, I had a touch. <laughs> the night before, someone sent me a text that said, happy anniversary. And I thought, anniversary of what? And so I looked and I thought, it's August. So I don't know. I, I mean, they put it on your phone. I don't know why I didn't realize because we're deep into August. So... That's yeah. Yesterday I was uh, the 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 best thing that happened was is I left before my wife got up. Well, then she called me after I left about twenty minutes ago, and I was like, "Happy anniversary, babe!" I was like, "I saw you, but you were sleeping. I didn't want to want to wake you up." And she was like, <laughs> "And it actually worked," because she was like, "Oh, that was fine. I feel so bad that." You know, you should have woke me up or whatever. So then that gave me some time. So so I basically went shopping all day yesterday. And uh, I took care of that. So when I saw her, and then she had kind of planned the night. She was like, let's go out. We actually Because now with the coronavirus surge, we basically went to the restaurant. Wasn't anybody there. And then we went to a movie, and there was literally no one there at the movies. <laughs> we had our own personal theater. Yeah, we so, your mama, your mama and and I have, have we're not that far along. I mean, you know. What do you mean? To pick a day out like that, the anniversary, and then we go shopping. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, no, I, I went shopping. I haven't gotten into <laughs> that that zone yet, Jay. But it's good luck to you. That's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's take a break. <laughs> So, you know, we talked, uh, we referenced, Dad, the Alpha and the Omega, you know, from the Bible that God, Jesus is the beginning and the end. And I had not thought about until you brought that up that, you know, one of our sponsors is Omega XL. So I don't know exactly why they've never said why they've never told me why they named it that. But I'm thinking it's the end of inflammation. Omega XL. Hmm. What do you think? It's a good line. Uh, it could be even biblical, uh, right? Yeah, that's probably. So enough. these guys, uh, I, I spent quite a bit of time talking with Dr. McQuillan on on the science behind this 
you know, thing that they supplement that they've come up with that basically ends inflammation. They've been doing this 35 years. They know what they're talking about. Dad and I both take it. It's been great. It has been the end of aches and pains for us. So we want to encourage you to give it a shot. OmegaXL.com slash Phil. When you go there or you call them at 800-844-4888, you're going to buy a bottle and you get a second bottle for free. So you get two months supply. And that's about how long it takes to really kick in and start working. So check it out, OmegaXL.com slash Phil, OmegaXL.com slash Phil, or call them at 800-844-4888. That's 800-844-4888. After 50-something years, they hadn't gotten that far along. No, I've, never, I've, never, I've never entered that zone. You know what's Ooh. funny is people put on there that it's your anniversary online. Because I've had probably 30 people text me and say happy anniversary, which is kind of right. weird. Why Why weird. Are, are other people texting me about my anniversary? Uh, do, Al, do you wish other people happy anniversary? Not really. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't really keep up that much. I no. mean, I, sometimes like family birthdays. I may, I mean, I remember your, you know, my brother's birthday and my kids and my grandkids. But other than that, that's about as far as the memory. Yeah. But you're right. Now everything post I saw was your anniversary on Twitter because Mia saying. Moo, Mia Moo said happy anniversary, mom and dad from Mia. Well, I'm not so familiar that's with how Twitter, I knew it was so your I, anniversary. I just, it's a misstep. You know, for me to try to explain Twitter to you. Because it's a bird <laughs> that tweets, but you're the bird. You're you're a tweeter, so you put out a tweet, and it's a little shape of a little. Looks like a little. What kind of bird is that? Dove, kind of. Really a dove, dove maybe? more like a parakeet. Pigeon. I think it's more like a parakeet. <laughs> a parakeet. So you got a bunch of tweeters together. Yeah, everybody's just sharing information on various <laughs> thoughts and. Yeah, I've never tried that. <laughs> <laughs> I would say it's so dad to to properly explain it I would say it's a lot of angry birds that are chirping on Twitter because it's more yeah, anger yeah, than that's, <laughs> hey. yeah that's, that's, that's so not, you know when you see a, when you see the occasional happy anniversary or happy birthday that's kind of a positive because most of the stuff on there is negative city it's yeah. kind of toxic I would call it Some especially the comments uh, so. that are out there guys that I'm 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 just on purpose, I just, I just say, I think I can yeah. go without that. I don't, I don't get on there much. I mean, I three, I think three years ago, I kind of detached myself from social media. But I have people who are family who look at it, and occasionally mm -hmm. I will get on there and post something. You know? I asked your mother the other day, yesterday, I think it was. She said something about, well, I just hope, you know. I'm, when I fall every once in a while, you know, I got this bruise on my leg. She said, I hope it doesn't make you mad. I said, Miss Kay, let me ask you something. When's the last time you saw me mad, angry? And she said, I can't remember. Well, that's it's, good. It's been so long. Yeah, that's a good thing. Well, you got to give credit to the Lord on that. Last yeah. time I saw Dad angry is what? I don't, I don't get angry. I don't get angry in a while. Uh, last time I saw you angry was when that big bunch, that 75 Mallards tried to come in there and we were leaving too early. And oh, so no. I, let, let's get we, the facts straight on this. <laughs> the, I had, I, there's something in my DNA, my duck DNA from years of experience. <laughs> I can tell when the potential is there. And that morning I kept seeing large groups of mallards floating around and we weren't really shooting many of them. Mm -hmm. And I said, I, I think we need to go till, till noon. Let's give it till noon. But everybody had something going. Remember Al had lined you up something to go do a radio show. An interview. Or, and so, yep. but we, we just got down to it and everybody was ready to go. But me and I was like, I think we should give it till 12. And so they got into the old deal. Well, if you leave now and go get the boat, cause we had, boat parked away that by the time you get the boat it'll be 12 but i didn't like it because i was like let's just wait till 12 remember it was like 11 30 oh yeah and so uh next thing you know you took off to get the boat it was not 12 o'clock size for that which is really strange about this story because usually si just sits in, in yeah, the he line. Well, this it, is a few years. This is a few years yeah, ago. But he was ready he to go. He was ready to go. So he goes out there and starts yep. picking up decoys. 
while you're going to get the boat, which I didn't like it. I was frustrated already. It had been slow duck hunting. It's slow at that. It was slow, but I had seen a few bunches, and I thought, I'm telling you, I feel like, man, I kept saying that. And so I look up, you're almost to the boat, and here comes 75 to 100 mallards just across the, the horizon. And at that time of the day, with everything I had seen, I, I thought we could get them. And remember, I hollered. I said, there they are. You got two. I said, you got two minutes. Find a tree. Because they weren't like coming toward us. So I declared that. I said, find a tree. And so I blew a duck call at them. And about two to three minutes later, they turned out there. So now I'm thinking everyone's hit. I'm thinking Phil, because I said I declared. You remember when I said well, I, I got behind a tree? I said, Find the tree. Th- those that duck's one of the biggest bunch of ducks we've ever seen at our place. They it make about eighty to hundred. It was over hundred. Yeah, I thought it was over a hundred. It was over a hundred. They, they make a turn on the yeah. left <laughs> and they lock up and just start coming, literally straight down so hard that they were making a sound just like a, in, in a like a jet like a freight train i heard them the hair stood and up on so the back I'm of my neck and si and phil are hiding behind the tree which phil was and they get right at the point of where they're almost in the hole and they flared well i looked up i stuck my head up and si is standing right in the middle of the decoys he's not under a tree he's just standing there putting decoys on a string so i just took my gun and raised up and killed one of the of the hundred i shot remember i made a long shot one shot and i i killed one just to say that it wasn't a complete meltdown and that nothing died so <laughs> one big mallard drake folded and boy did it ever break loose after that? That, that was, <laughs> argument lasted for years. <laughs> Me and Ty tied into it because I said, "Why didn't you hit the tree? I told you to hit the tree." Of course, I said I was behind the tree, but no. he wasn't behind it because he couldn't just say I didn't think they were coming in there, and I just didn't want to find the tree. So it was that was a source my it? feelings have been hurt ever since then that i was standing there while i didn't give it another <laughs> well, 10 minutes yeah i there heard was that about sound three. they made and they were coming straight down and it was like a jet they were just, but you're right al that is the last time i was angry of course we all apologize well, and dad it, dad was angry too because because there was about three butt chewings when we all got back to the house oh, it was and one one of them was me for lining up media during duck season, which, by the way, by, by the way, I, you know, you can say a lot of things about Al, but I learned the lesson. Yeah. I do not line up things for dad during duck season anymore. That was yeah. the last time because I, I tell people, they're like, well, we got to get Phil to do this or that or these book people. We also or this have people a rule that now where no one ever goes out in the decoys or anything while we're still hunting. Like if somebody goes to get right. to the boat or whatever, everybody else remains there with their guns loaded to this day yep. until the motor fires up. Cause then you're not going right. to get them anyway. That's right. So yeah, it was well, a- that's the difference though. in me and Cy, I learned my lesson, but Cy still claims that this day he didn't do anything wrong. That well, hard headed joker. Well, the other that's times, the difference uh, between me and him. It was a lot like that. We waited all day. We hunted from daylight and it's five minutes until legal shooting hours is over. I said, boys, I've had enough. So I go get the boat, and and we I get the boat. It's pretty close. We back out of the thing, and look, we get 75 yards from the blind leaving with five minutes left of legal. And we just look up, and about 100 lit in our decoys. So I told him, I stopped, shut my motor off. I said, let me tell you guys something. I just saw 100 mallard ducks go into that hole in light right there in that thing. I said, if you're going to sit here all day, d- <laughs> wait the, la- the last five minutes. D- yeah. d- don't leave five minutes. If you're going to sit there all day. I mean, why would why, why would a human... It was the dumbest thing I've ever done. I said, yeah. why wouldn't you just wait the other five minutes in, uh, while it was legal? I said, don't ever do that. Wait the other five minutes. Because, you know, it's typical men. I don't know, maybe women the same way. But I've seen these impulses when you don't think it's going to happen. It's something to do with you lose hope. 
and you're just ready to go. You you want to distance yourself from the misery that was what happened as far as the result mm -hmm. it just didn't happen. And then you you're so convinced. But in duck hunting, we coined a phrase that has become forever true. You never know. You never know. Whatever you decide, you, you got to go with it. Yeah. So, so, that, so now, let's take if another I stay, break. If I stay, you can bet one thing. If the legal shooting arts is over or at 503, I'm waiting to 503, and then I leave here. Yeah. And a lot of times, for some reason or another, about the time you fix it, especially late in the evening, Ducks to roost a little early or something, but, oh, but we've killed a lot know. of ducks you never in, a, know. in a ten minute time frame. If you think about it, you know what, Jay? Yeah. My favorite phrase that we coined is you got to ride the hole. Ride the hole. <laughs> <laughs> let's uh let's take a break. One of the uh, dangers I found out, you guys wouldn't know about this, but me being down here on the on the beach at the southern lair is that my grandkids were just here. And when grandkids have been to the beach and then they come and get into your bed, you know, ma'am and pap's bed, sand in the sheets is not a good thing. No. Could y'all agree with that? I mean, you don't experience it like I do, but it doesn't sound very good, does it? I think you need to have a meeting. <laughs> no grandkids well, in the bed it, if you're on the beach. That's a good rule. That's right. No grandkids in the bed. So the sheets that we have on our bed are outstanding if you can keep the sand out of them. It's a, a company called Bowl and Branch, B-O-L-L -L and Branch. And uh, they make a wonderful organic cotton signature hem sheet. They're fantastic. They're super soft. They're very enjoyable. And uh, we want to encourage you guys to give them a shot. You go to Bowl and Branch, B O L L A N D B R A N C H dot com, and you're going to get 15% off your first set of sheets if you use the promo code Robertson. So that's Bowl and Branch dot com, promo code Robertson, and keep the grandkids out of your bed. So, Jace, that could make a good spiritual application. What you just said a minute ago that people tend to want they when they lose hope yep. they want to distance themselves that, that's interesting i hadn't thought about it from it that really perspective but true. that's what happens in a spiritual sense yeah when they lose hope i've seen people literally i see jay do it all the time when he doesn't think it's going to happen but we're like you never know i think we ought to give it another hour he will literally get his stuff and walk out that's right because he's hopeless <laughs> he's done. That, that something is going to happen. And Even look, my dog that, that I've just retired, got two more going to take his place, but the dog that I'm retiring, one of his little uh, pensions was if we hunt to like 1030 and we've uh, killed three ducks and we shot them at about 730, 8 o'clock. So we've been sitting there three or four hours. Well, he gets up. He did this the, all of his life. He would get up, jump over in where we are. He's out there in a little box. He would jump out of that box, and when he starts meeting and greeting, he meets them, eats us, and greets us. Each hunter, he walks through the whole bunch of hunting. What he's saying is, it's over. Let's go. Let's, let's go. <laughs> he, he, I said, well, we, and, and I never saw him fail. In other words, when he when you finally saw old Blue coming, <laughs> I said, well, Blue's saying, it's over, boys. I might as well go We're down. Done. He greets everybody, and he'll walk up to everybody. Each person can pet him. He's saying, it's over. No use sitting here any longer. And every time, he's been right. What's interesting is he would meet and greet everybody, but he, he liked to pee on side. So I don't know what that means in the dog not world. Looking at our Jason and he peed on their bag. No, he peed so on my <laughs> stuff, but he peed on side. <laughs> they were mean himself. to him. They were mean to him, and he was like, <laughs> no, we "Pee on you," you know. I've never been mean to that dog in my life. He just doesn't like me. <laughs> but he's retired. We got one that won't whine this year, Jason. I had to read this. Well, that's going to be my thought on demon possession of animals with that dog because he seemed to have an evil <laughs> spirit within him for whatever reason. It's possible. It happened to hogs. Yeah. Remember when the 200 hogs were <laughs> yeah. around? Oh, yeah. uh -huh. I guess anything's possible. So this uh, this Sunday, uh, we're, I'm preaching, uh, Mike and I are preaching on Romans 15, 14, which is where we are in our Romans text. So I wanted to bounce my sermon 
off of you guys, maybe get some ideas. I get good stuff from the two of y'all when I'm preaching. Uh, what's interesting, Jace, is this: we are also this Sunday honoring your in-laws, yep. uh, Larry and Peggy, because uh, this year, I think was this year, maybe it was last year, marks 50, so now 50 plus years of them being in ministry. And uh, Larry has always done a ministry called We Care, which is kind of a crusade type ministry, I guess you'd call it, where you, he go, you know, does these seminars, teaches people how to share the gospel with people, and then like has like a three or four or five day deal where people can come in, bring people in, they and they, you know, he preaches the gospel to them. Yeah, he's been doing it a long time. He's led a lot of people to Christ, and so oh, yeah, that's I mean, always been a thousands. part of our church's ministry. Yeah, uh, he's led a lot of people. You know, back yeah. in the day, what was so funny is because back in the day when you used to could knock on people's doors, they did that for like years, you know, which they probably twenty five years ago did that because now these days, you know, you knock on somebody's door. Number one, they're probably not going to answer. Number two, they, they may, you know, get a gun. Or, I, I tried it. Or call the law. I, I yeah. had to bow out because I told them, because every door I would knock on, nobody would ever answer the door. Yeah. And it was a door knocking. <laughs> I'm trying to be I know part. why. And, and, and I finally got to looking, and I would see window shades and just an eye <laughs> would be looking out the, the window shade. And I'd go to the next house, and I got to notice, and I'd, I'd notice – window shades and they're just their eye looking so i told them i said look when they see me standing there they won't open the door so i look a little scraggly so i, I said i don't think i'm gonna fit into the door knocking ministry i don't think they i don't so think the, so dad they whatever you were selling they weren't buying they weren't buying. They, they weren't oh, even the open. last the <laughs> last not open that door jeff and i were in austin and there's this old place right in the middle of town i mean you can just tell it's old but that literally civilization has cropped up all over it, but it's like a little ranch right in the middle. And I was like, I know this place is old. I was like, let's just pull in. There was a car there. I was like, Jeff, you, you're nice and friendly. Knock on the door and see if they'll let us metal detect here. He knocked on that door and this woman, older woman, she just started hollering. We could hear help, help, you know, and Jeff was like, Oh, do you need help? And she's like, help. Well, but she was scared. She was hollering because <laughs> somebody like Jet was knocking on the door. <laughs> that's, that's not a very she good was needing help to, from y'all. That's not yeah. a good welcome for Austin, Texas. I said, Jet, you're the only person dumb enough to think that she was asking for your help. She was <laughs> like, no, help me. You're knocking well, on the door. Well, my door knocking campaign, there was a lot of that going on. I mean, you know, the phones were ringing, people putting on, oh, what yeah. are you doing? I'm like, well, I, I, we were trying to get a Bible study. Hey, hit the road. I'm yeah, like, okay. I remember telling him that. I remember telling my father-in-law, I was like, look, because uh, he was trying to get me to go to one of his seminars. I was like, I'll go, but I'm not knocking on doors. And he's like, why? I was like, you, you don't realize why that's a problem? I said, if I knock on somebody's door and they don't know who I am, whatever's fixing to happen is not good. Whatever that this is not a recipe for the gospel being shared. I said, <laughs> either the law's going to be called, weapons are going to be drawn, or they're not going to answer. I have some neighbors, and the other day, and I and I went by there trying to get another guy a job, and this guy is a he works a you know in a heavy equipment, but one of his daughters opened the door when I knocked. I hadn't visited these people at all, and they don't live too far from me, but. She almost just kind of squalled out a little bit and and stepped back two or three steps. And I said, call your daddy. I said, I need to talk to him. And he was in the back of the house, you know, but it scared her. So I I, I yeah. knew right then, door knocking is not, not, not a good, not a wise move these days. That's exactly right. And they learned to, to pivot from that and to do some different tactics. And uh, they're still able to help people, which is good. Yeah. Let's take another break. So, Jace, what's the worst thing about being on a boat out in the ocean? Throwing up. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, you get sick, right? You get, I, I'm the same way. I have a really hard time with motion sickness, and I have since I was a kid. Jace has it, too. I don't know. I guess we uh, – I don't know. Dad, were you ever motion sick? Do you no, know? Did it we depends get that from on you? what I'm catching, whether I can endure. I don't mind catching a huge <laughs> fish and then throwing up and catching another one. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, you'd rather not have the throw it up, right, not. if you could help it. 
So I got a product for you, Jace. Yeah. Uh, one of our newer sponsors is called Relief Band, and it's a wristband that you put onto your wrist, and it prevents nausea and vomiting. Well, you need uh, to send me one. It's of fantastic. Those. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to get you one. It's 100% drug free, no drowsy. It's all natural relief with zero side effects. Because you know you take some of this other stuff and you get sleepy and then you can't fish. You know, it really is a is a mummer. This thing, the technology of it, it taps a nerve that's in your wrist that goes to your brain and says, "Don't throw up," and which is a pretty good idea if you ask me. So we want you to check it out. Uh, we're going to get one to, for Jay's to check out. You go to reliefband.com. Use the promo code UNASHAMED. You're going to receive 20% off plus free shipping and a no questions asked 30-day money back guarantee, which is fantastic. So you get to try it for 30 days. If you don't like it, you can send it back. Relief, R-E-L-I-E-F, band, B-A-N-D, dot com. Use the promo code UNASHAMED for 20% off and free shipping. So I, I, I found it interesting that it all kind of came together because we're honoring them at the beginning of our uh, time before we preach Sunday and sort of it's like a, you know, it's like a home base has always been WFR for Larry and Peggy. So it's kind of a us recognizing that and that, you know, here at home. And it, it just so happens that in this text in Romans 15, 14 through 33, Paul is about at the end of this letter because the last chapter he addresses the churches that are that are, you know, meeting there. And he, he kind of has, I would call it, it's kind of a homecoming moment because in two ways, one is he's going to Rome. And of course that's, that's going to be the end of it for Paul. He doesn't know that specifically, but when you read Timothy and Titus, you know, when he gets there, he realizes that's pretty much it. I mean, he, he's going to write a few more letters, but you know, that's going to be the end for him. But you know, he said, Paul, remember he, when he was Saul, he was a Roman citizen uh, from Tarsus, which is actually kind of just off of Turkey is where his, his Tarsus was. But he's a Roman citizen. So in a sense, he's coming home, you know, to his, you know, his roots of being a Roman citizen. But also he's going to make the in this text, he's going to make the last trip to Jerusalem, which is also considered home. For Paul, because he spent most of the first half of his life being trained to be a Pharisee. And so Jerusalem is obviously very special because in every one of Paul's books, he's, he first appeals to the Jew, then to the Gentile. So I thought it was interesting. So it's like a homecoming for him. And then when he gets there in Rome, he talks about, you know, I poured out my life like a drink offering. I'm ready to go home, meaning his eternal home. So I just thought it was really interesting that at the end of the book of Romans, this is almost like a reflection of everything Paul has done in his life up to this point, because he's nearing the end uh, of the, of the situation. So I thought that was kind of a interesting that we had both those happening on the same Sunday. I think it's one thing that stood out to me just reading it, because I'm not as familiar with 14 through, what is it in, 33. 16? As a, yeah, all the oh, way to 16, yeah, yeah. One, you know. Uh, but because it is like a, his personal view, and, and he's real vulnerable to the people he's trying to help. But I do notice that right. every, everything he says, he's he's really – uh, detail oriented on making sure that it's not about him. You know, when he says yeah. in verse 15, he's like, I'm doing this because of the grace that God gave me to be a minister of Christ Jesus. And then he kind of says at the end so that I might be become an offering acceptable or that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable. God sanctified by the Holy spirit. Then he does kind of the same thing in verse 30 where he says, I urge you brothers by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the spirit to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. It's like he's using every aspect of the Trinity to show them. I, it's not about me. This is about God being a father. We're focusing on Jesus and we're doing it by the power of the Holy Spirit. We're trying, you know, God has sanctioned me and by his grace to be this representative of the Gentiles. I just I just find it kind of fascinating. And I think if we all did in our ministry, if we were quick to use that as the formula, because most people you're like, how's the church going? And they're like, they're telling you all the things they've done, you know. 
but it's not in that same vein, you know. Well, what of, it, what of the it, I think it's interesting now that <clears throat> that it, it's almost like when you get the fourteen and following uh, to be. The, the God, the grace God gave me to be a minister of Christ to the Gentile with a priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel. He brings it back up in about verse uh, 2020. 20. It's always been my ambition to, to preach the gospel where Christ was not known. So it, he's kind of going back to the opening line in Romans, which says a servant of Christ Jesus, Paul, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand. Now he talks about the resurrection just below that, uh, apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles and obedience. But he does point out that my purpose, and he brings it back up in Romans 15, of his purpose in Romans chapter 1, the first few opening lines, he ends up, you know, I, I came here to Rome to preach the gospel. The, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. But that chapter one is outlined. He's confirming what he was put here and the purpose that he was there yeah. by letting them know I'm here. To, and he mentions it with much deference, the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel to the Gentiles. But he's also given. It, it should it, help the credit. Jewish people. These words, it should help them understand that. The gospel, and he, he did it all throughout the book of Romans, the gospel is for everyone. G -R -G -R. Well, were, it made them uncomfortable, just as uncomfortable yeah. as people are today about some people. He was just confirming the priestly duty is all nations can but be, don't you, uh, will be saved. Don't you love that, though, That because yeah. coming from his perspective of what a priest would do in the Jewish you know, <laughs> worship, Correct. they would prepare a sacrifice offered up on behalf of the people, yep. although the sacrifices they were offering could never take away sin. Now he's saying you're a priest and you're preparing people to be the sacrifice. Yep. I love that. Cause, and, and then we know from Romans 12, what you now offer is your own living body as a sacrifice to the almighty. So yep. I love that concept that he pivots out of the Jewish, you know, copy from the old Testament into now this is where all, yeah, he's We're already all covered all the differences and and the and the the wedges that come in there between two groups, the Jew and Gentile, Jew and Gentile, Jew and Gentile. Well, he begins to in Romans fifteen toward the end there, he begins to make it known that uh, the priestly duty of getting the gospel to the Gentiles was a major effort on God's part through him. But also, look, you know what stands out to me? That Romans 15, 17 in ministry, because, you know, everywhere I go, I was like, you got to focus on Jesus. And on uh, Sunday mornings, I say, let's focus on Jesus. And we've all had people accuse us of sharing the same thing. They're like, how come y'all keep sharing the same thing over and over? I've been asked that many a time. Yeah. People are like, well, let's get into the, the deeper truths mm. uh, of and I, I read that Romans 15, 17, he says, therefore, I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. I mean, the whole point of this is he's saying I'm focused on Jesus. That's what I glory in, because that's how you relate to God and his principles. All the things they were having trouble with, if they just went to see how Jesus operated in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, which is basically what he was trying to get them to see. You'll see that God views everybody as va valuable. He He died for everybody. That's we're, it. We're going to embrace the whole world. I mean, yep. all of a sudden it became revolutionary. And then he repeated that. Hey, hey Jace. It, hey, Jace. Let's take our last break. He repeated that in the second verse. I mean, I just think if you're doing a lesson on this, you got to bring this up about how despite all the difficult passage passages in Romans that he addressed, it just gets so simple here in the end. It He's does. like, I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me. That's I mean, it. He's like, this is about what Jesus did and gave me this platform. It's not unlike anything I say when I go speak, because the bigger this gets, the more the the gospel reaches in the world, the smaller you, you become. 
he zeroes in on the gospel and he's basically saying this these this what's happened what god has done through jesus that 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 is the deeper truths of the bible exactly that's what all this is about well i think i think as a church or as a believer or as a pastor and we got a lot of people listen to us you want to be known because he said if i'm in the service to god that means you're a servant if you're in service you are a servant. And he says, I'm a servant of the gospel. I'm a servant to the people. I'm a servant to God. So that's the old idea is nothing else matters except these things. And so if you want to be known for something, that's what you want to be known for. You I'm a servant you. of Christ. You bet you. I mean, that needs to be what other people recognize you as being. Yeah. What's that old song? Jesus died and rose again. Well, that could be a bunch of songs. <laughs> <laughs> but, I don't know we need a little team. more to go. You know, to. let the weak say I am strong. Oh, yeah. 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 Or, no, I think it says I am Let the poor high. say I am rich. Yep. Oh. Yeah. Uh, man, I hadn't heard that in a while. Jesus died and rose again. I hadn't again. either. But that's what Jesus the died and rose again. saying there. Or like in Christ Alone, that's the song we sing a lot. It's like To me, it's like an anthem, you know, for Jesus. Which is which is pretty good, and so you know J.C. shifts over. So after he says all that, and he he basically says this is what I'm all about. It he makes it very personal, verse twenty three, because he says, "But now there is no more place for me to work in these regions, and since I've been longing for many years to see you, I plan to do so when I go to Spain. I hope to visit you while passing through, and to have you assist me on my journey there. And I have enjoyed your company for a while." Now, however, I'm on my way to Jerusalem in the service of the saints there. So that was that last trip to Jerusalem. And he goes on to describe that the reason he's going there is to bring some financial support from the Gentile churches to the Jewish churches. Because, you know, the thing about Jew, the Jews were under occupation of Roman Empire and they're having to pay all these double taxes. I mean, the people there were in a bind. And what he's saying is we, you get all these new brothers and sisters that are Gentiles and they need to help the original, you know, Jewish Christian church. And so that's that, that gift he brings. So even in his reflection of that, I love the idea that the gospel naturally looks out for the kingdom and looks out for people. And that was his point is I'm going there one last time and Which it's going to be to bring them gifts even, from you. When, yeah. When you don't even like, I mean, the Jews were probably looking at these Gentiles. They didn't like the situation already because they're like, we're God's chosen people. You now could you're... take that. You could take that and Al and apply that to modern day. The Messianic Jews, the ones who do, in fact, have, have, have viewed Jesus as the Messiah, correctly so. Right. Uh, they can have a big role in helping bring Jew and Gentile together as one. Yeah, but my point is when the Jews then saw that Gentile money was coming to them and they're having a bad attitude about them even being saved, I think there was a dynamic in that that made them think, well, wait a minute here. Because it's just like anything else in life, sadly. If somebody starts giving you money, well, all of a sudden it opens you up to uh, whatever they're trying to sell. Yep. I, I mean, you know, you're like yep. – because. Most people like, yo, I love you. I'll try to help you when I can. I'll do anything for you, but I ain't giving you a dime until I see something supernatural yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to change my view. So I just think he was using that to try to show them, look, we're all, because they, I know they had a problem opening this up to the Gentile world. That, that would have been a struggle. Yep. And, you know, Dad, to your point, I was I was reading recently about some Messianic Jews that had been going into old Eastern Bloc countries, you know, Russia and that area, mm -hmm. and find a lot of old Jewish, mostly widows, that had been displaced after World War II. Because, you know, people just scattered in every direction to try to get away from Hitler and the regime. And so they found all these old widows that were old Jewish widows. And, of course, they're just poverty-stricken, starving to death. But it was a, a big chunk of Messianic Jews that are going to those areas and bringing relief and, you know, bringing food and trying to bring help and to support that. And I thought, man, that really is what it's all about. That's a 21st century thing that's happening that was a lot like what we're seeing in the first century yeah, that Huckabee, Paul was doing. Mike Huckabee works with those people. 
He does. Yeah. And there's a lot of really good people. Uh, so do the guy, our, our buddies out at 700 Club, the Robertsons, yeah. uh, Pat Robertson, his crew, they do the same thing, which is incredible. I mean, that's what we should be. That's what the gospel does. It doesn't try to, it, it helps anybody. That was his point. He was like, you've gotten their spiritual blessing. He was telling Gentiles. So you should help their physical blessings, you know, and I, and I, but I think he was doing it to try to get them to see that God truly loves everybody. And we share, we, we have something bigger in common. That yeah, we now Larry's to. work over the last 50 years and Peggy knows, uh, a lot of them, they, they got support from people worldwide, uh, Al, you know? Oh, yeah. And they call their group the cadre. And about I think about 50 to 100 of them are coming for Sunday for the celebration. But they're spread out all over the world. But their their focus has been to make sure and get the gospel out. So my my points as we wrap it up here, that was the first part of that was the singular nature of the gospel. In other words, the gospel has to be first. Then there's a servant nature of the gospel. It is to serve other people. Then there's a sharing nature of the gospel, which is what we just talked about. And the last text I find interesting because, Jace, you said the word earlier. Paul shows his vulnerability. Look at verse 30. I urge you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. Pray that I may be rescued from the unbelievers in Judea, that my service in Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints there, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and together to be refreshed. So I, I love the concept that he closes with the struggling nature of the gospel, meaning that we're always going to have obstacles that are put in our way to share with people. You're going to have people get after you. You're going to be persecuted. People, He said, pray that the believers will accept me, meaning that even in the first century, there were people that were, you know, didn't like certain things that were going. He was already facing the grumps and the gripes in the first century. Well, why don't you make, it's a struggle. Why don't you make the fifth point as your imitation and have the spirit of the gospel? Because he I says like the See, love that's I like of the spirit. Well, the struggle, because you need the spirit to help the struggle. And the, what would you say? And to focus on the singular. They all started with the S, didn't it? What was yeah. number two and three? It was singular, singular. serving, sharing, struggling, and now you spirit can, you nature. You can't leave the, the spirit out because that's what's going to give you the ability to do it, which I think is his point. That's why I said he summed up the Godhead there in that verse 30. And then that's why I think when it leads to Romans 16, which is so, to me, Romans 16 is a real powerful chapter from a way that you wouldn't think. Because it's nobody knows what Romans 16 is about because when you get it, you're like, well, that's just the closing credits. But he focuses <laughs> on all these people who have been his partners in this whole ministry. And look, they're meeting in houses. It's a married couple. It's a single woman. It's it, it's just random people, male, female, and, and couples who along the way were warriors in, in getting, Which getting Jesus out. kind of shows out. Larry and Peggy and their work with various individuals worldwide. It does. That's why I like that it God brought it all together for us in particular on this day that we were talking about that. Well, and Jace, that's a perfect tease for the where we're going to go next week. But, but it's to finish powerful out to me with, because it's not what you think. Most people think, oh, the church leadership across the world, and you're thinking these senior pastors and all the churches getting together. But yep. his crew just looked like a montage of a single woman here, a couple here, some old yeah. guy over here, two sisters over at this house. Yeah, that's true. Uh, it, it just made it more real. And you know what it seemed like to me? It was way more like Jesus's ministry. Yep. It's not in buildings. It, it's the spirit in people, in communities where you would never think or suppose sharing Jesus in a real powerful way. And I think you're right. And I'll close with this, Chase. It, back to verse 14. To the people you're talking about, he said, I'm in verse 14, I myself am convinced, my brothers, these ones you're talking about, that you yourselves are full of goodness, complete in knowledge, and competent to instruct one another. It was that it was that group that was going to change the world. Yep. You know? And they did. And they did. Yeah. Praise God. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube. And be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. 
And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.